Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching The Purge Election Year in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Purge Election Year, released in 2016, an actual election year in the U.S. So you know this movie had some bomb-ass SEO. Election Year takes place nearly two decades after the first two films, and depicts a country torn in half over The Purge. While it continues to show the street-level perspective we saw on Anarchy, Election Year also explores the political machinations behind The Purge, increasing the stakes from the lives of a few characters to the very moral fiber of the United States of America. Like the other Purge movies, Election Year also has an insanely high body count. Can this populist newcomer of a film beat the establishment Belko experiment for most kills on this channel? Let's find out and get to the election. Er, the kills. The Election Year kills. The movie begins with Mark Bowling glamming out before Ray Davis' bass tones take over, since this funky purger's got a real type of thing going down getting down. He explains in a real weird voice acting delivery. My Purge playlist. I put a lot of thought into it, especially this final tune, as it'll be the last song you'll ever hear. He sounds like an exasperated side character on The Simpsons, but this dude is no Gil Gunderson. He's a sadistic home invader who tells the mother of this unfortunate nuclear family that she has to choose the one family member who gets to live. The rest are all getting googly-eyed to death. As we'll see, Mama Roan must have chosen her bespectacled daughter Charlie to live, so I'll go ahead and put the rest of the Roan family on the count right now, even though their deaths don't happen on screen. Instead, the cold open ends with a card putting us 18 years in the future, which is a bizarre fucking choice to me for reasons we'll see shortly. Now Charlie Roan, who you can tell is the same character because of her glasses, is a senator running for president on an anti-purge platform, a popular issue for the public after they've learned more about the new founding fathers' corruption. There are even outspoken anti-purge activists like this dude, Dante Bishop, the character formerly known as Stranger, who is yet again played by Edwin Hodge even though he looks the same age. But fuck it, make it 18 years later. Charlie is played by Elizabeth Mitchell, aka Juliet Burr, Sawyer's true love. Don't at me, skate shippers. She's running against NFFA candidate Minister Edwidge Owens, who watches a report about her rising poll numbers with the rest of the party on a kick-ass George Washington portrait television. By the way, the report mentions that the NFFA has been in power for 25 years. So here's the purge timeline. The NFFA wins the 2016 election and starts the purge the next year in 2017. The first two movies take place during purges 6 and 7 in 2022 and 2023, and it's now around 2041, making this purge number 25. Fuck nailed it. Hey there, Future James here saying I didn't actually nail it, because it turns out Election Year actually takes place 18 years after the sixth Purge, the one in the original movie, making the year 2040 and the Purge the 24th one, so sorry, my bad. And party boss Caleb Warrens has decided to celebrate the Purge's silver anniversary by lifting the restriction on government officials. In other words, this year, you could purge a presidential candidate with impunity. During a presidential debate wherein Owens defends the Purge, Charlie rails against it as a religion of murder. The Midnight Purge Mass, where our great NFFA leaders gather together and slaughter innocents. You know, actually, when you put it like that, how the fuck's the country even going along with this shit? Charlie Roan shows herself to be a firebrand populist who gets the audience to their feet and all but crowd surfs among them. That kind of behavior is vexing for her head of security, Sergeant Leo Barnes? Frank Grillo again, looking the exact same as he did in Anarchy. Which, again, took place 18 years prior to this. Why did they do that if they wanted to use the same characters? How old is Leo Barnes? Lest you think the series is abandoning the ground-level view of Purge Night, Charlie's campaign is watched and commented on by working class Joe Dixon, a dude who owns a deli frequented by EMT Laney Rucker, played by Get Out's Betty Gabriel. Joe's assistant Marcos is a huge Charlie chap and says she could win if she takes Florida, but Laney is all like, no, 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 and thinks the senator is full of shit. For his part, Joe likes Charlie but thinks she's unlikely to win, while the fourth dude in the deli isn't even paying attention to politics. I'm thinking about waffles and pussy. That's all I ever really think about, actually. Joe gets a call saying the Purge movies need even more commentary on American society, so he hangs up and complies. The damn insurance company, they just raised the premium on my Purge coverage. 
by thousands the day before the damn purge. He don't have that money, so he resolves to protect the store himself since all his livelihood is in it. He wants to guard against rotten apples like this mean girl Kimmy and her nameless friend who like to knock shit over and fly swat each other's butts. Lainey steps in on the conflict since she has some street cred being formerly known as Pequeña Muerte, the little death. Yo, you're my motherfucking hero. But now Lainey's all like, don't do drugs and stay in school, so Kimmy leaves with some serious side eye. Despite the announcement about government officials being fair game, Charlie refuses Leo's suggestion to get a safe house since it wouldn't be very populist of her. And already I just want these two to fuck. Talk about sexual tension. Leo does his best to secure Charlie's home with another member of the Roan campaign, Chief Cooper, and on the night of the big event, Leo locks down the house and they all settle in for some quality purge night programming that reminds the viewers no one is immune tonight. Must be sweeps week. Sirens blare all around our nation's capital as the purge officially begins. Charlie pulls Leo away from his security buddy Eric, or should I say Bluetooth Eric, and orders him to have a drink with her. Just fuck already! The drink is just water, but they still open up and talk about their equally tragic backstories. Leo says he nearly made a huge mistake on purge night and believes in the senator's mission to get rid of the holiday. Meanwhile, Lainey is spending her purge night, as always, driving around in a triage van with her friend Dawn, looking for people they can help out. Like this guy, who jump scares them at their window and Oh, now there's an arrow in his head. Categorize him as unlikely to live regardless of medical care. They drive around with a whole shit ton of dissolves and witness heinous acts of violence like an alleyway guillotine exhibition that looks like it's claiming its third victim of the night. Those bros and that alien are loving it. They also see some metal masked homies driving around with two of their three human hood ornaments looking pretty damn dead. So let's add another couple to the list here. And over at the Lincoln Memorial, oh, come on, who slaughtered all these people? This is a bitch to cow. I think I see 16 bodies and if not, let's just just pretend that's how many there are since Abe was the 16th president and that's fun. Over at the deli, Joe Dixon is up on the rooftop, click, 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 ready to defend his business from any looters. Marco shows up to pledge his help and although Joe tells him no at first, he might want to reconsider after a rogue electrical parade float finds its way from Main Street to Joe's Avenue. The occupants are Kimmy and her party girl friends, blaring Miley Cyrus and yelling up at Joe that they gonna get a candy bar from his shop and then burn the place to the ground. Marco shoots Kimmy's ear off and the girls take off, promising to be back later. Later. Yeah, maybe let Marco stay with you, Joe. Back at Charlie's home, Chief and Bluetooth Eric are up to some shady shit, manipulating the security cam footage and telling other guards to go take a break from their duty. A trio of guards outside join the kill count when they're all shot in the head, along with another trio of guards that Leo sees killed on the security cams after he quickly figures out the Saw 2 style trick that Chief was trying to play with the recorded footage. The murderers are a group of armored guys wearing white power and Nazi patches that Bluetooth Eric lets into the house, cause, you know, there's some very fine people on both sides. Inside, they shoot another three guards who were just standing there watching TV, so you know what, maybe that one's kind of on them. Leo rushes into action, giving the senator a vest to wear and telling her they've been betrayed. Bet a kiss would make things better. Instead, they go through Leo's secret escape hatch under the rug and make it outside to an alley. Now, maybe some celebratory lovemaking? Nah, no time for that. Leo has to take out his other little stabby thing and shank a couple of fucking Nazis with it after beating the shit out of them. Good job, Leo. I hate DC Nazis. Head Nazi Earl Danzinger is pretty pissed about the senator's escape and leaves in a huff right before one of his dudes sees Charlie and Leo from the window and shoots at them. He's able to hit Leo in the shoulder and takes him down, so Leo takes out his cell phone and connects to a briefcase bomb in Charlie's office. Leo detonates it and kills a handful of people in the room, including Bluetooth Eric, Chief, and two of the three armored Nazis in there, cause later we find out one of them lived. On their way through the streets of DC, which is burning like it's 1812 all over again, Leo and Charlie see a purge sanitation services truck telling folks to bring out the dead, and it looks like they've already got five bodies collected. At least that's how many are visible to me. After the truck drives away, the two of them run away holding hands just to torture me some more. They're pursued by a drone that looks straight out of a special edition Star Wars movie, but after Charlie intimately whispers to Leo that is flying right behind them, he shows her that he knows how to use that gun of his. Bullseye, Sergeant. Leo shows off his shooting skills some more when they're attacked by a Captain Spaulding cosplayer and a trio of his perjure friends. Leo shoots them all to death after getting some solid assistance from Charlie with a flaming 2x4? What is this, the ECW? But then more costume purgers show up and tase the crap out of Leo and Charlie, knocking them out. These new assailants on this purgy night are some murder tourists who were shown in a news broadcast earlier in the movie. They're rich foreigners who visit the U.S. on purge night to take advantage of the legalized murder. We like Americans. 
We're very excited. I guess it's like how us Michiganders would head over to Canada on our 19th birthday to legally drink, only, you know, just a little more murdery. These fair weather flag flyers get all up in Leo and Charlie's faces just down the street from Joe and Marcos. We love you, America. America is the greatest country in the world. So before they can make do on their threats of torture, they're lit up by the Deli Boys just unloading their guns on them. In the end, after they all get shot, I count eight dead bodies on the ground around Leo and Charlie. Joe and Marcos approach the senator and bodyguard to tell them, hey now, it's all right. They all go back to the deli, where Leo secures the area, and Charlie thanks her heroic constituents. At Joe's prompting, Marcos tells her that she needs Florida to win, as if that hasn't been painfully obvious since we all learned what a hanging chad was. Charlie wants Leo to take his jacket off and get his bullet wound cleaned up, but he tries to argue that he's fine. You're not. You want me to take it off? Yes, please! You'll both be so much happier. Marcos fixes Leo up, and then the goddamn glitterific gang is back, with more tools, weapons, and, uh, pigs to fuck shit up. Joe calls up Lainey for help, but she's busy tending to Rondo, the only survivor of an attack that left five bodies on the ground around her triage van. Add em up, add em up! Luckily, after the candy girls rev up their buzz saws to start cutting through the deli's metal barriers, Lainey gets the message and shows up to save the day. She speeds down the street and just plows right through Kimmy and her friend. The hit and run only kills her friend right away, but Lainey gets out of her van with a shotgun to emulate Leo Barnes with a kill streak of her own, complete with a side of pork and an appropriately brutal final shot for Kimmy herself. There goes her face! Back, bitches. Everyone goes outside to go with Lainey in her van, with Joe only agreeing to leave his deli unattended after Marcos promises him they'll rebuild it no matter what it takes. While driving around, somehow Charlie looks out her window to see this, I guess? Looks more like a dream or something, but regardless, we see four more bodies to add to the list, hanging from a tree there. Then the Nazis, who are flying around in a Nazi copter, track the van down through the bullet lodged in Leo's shoulder and open fire on it with a mounted minigun, not machine gun, as I learned in the last kill count. When the attack is over, we've got another body to add to the list, that dude Rondo, who was being taken care of by Lainey. The van pulls under a freeway overpass to lose the chopper, and Dawn parks near what looks like a crazy medieval time style purge fight between gang members. Leo figures out that the bullet must be how they found them, so he rips it out and confirms it's a tracer. That's when those rowdy fantasy fans see the van and surround it. Things are looking pretty bad, until Joe gives a whistle that turns out to be a secret crip passcode that he knows from his past on the streets, naturally. They safely open the door and make a trade with a dude who just wants some medical help for his friend. In exchange, the gang members agree to take the tracer bullet to another location for them. So when the Nazi ground forces track it down and find it, they also find a whole bunch of crips surrounding them. Their deaths happen off screen, but can be heard through the headphones worn by Nazi in the sky or old Danzinger. And he later lands to find their bodies and confirm the kills. Lainey and Dawn drive everyone to an underground structure that serves as a safe zone for poor people on purge night. It's run by Dante Bishop, who introduces himself to Charlie Roan and shows her around, while people gawk like they've never seen a presidential candidate before. Dante assures Leo that his men will do their best to keep them safe, but that doesn't stop Leo from snooping around. He and Charlie wind up in a room with an assassination plot vision board on the wall. Dante's people are looking to murder Minister Owens, the NFFA candidate for president, at the Our Lady of Sorrow church where his annual purge mass is taking place. Dante's man Angel tells them they're going to get inside the church using old tunnels installed by George Washington himself. The original founding fathers are about to fuck over the new founding fathers. Now how you like that fine? Well, Charlie doesn't like that at all, saying she doesn't want to build her presidency on a murder. Their argument is put on pause when security cameras show a shit ton of armed government soldiers on their way inside to clear out all their political enemies. Angel sends Leo and Charlie out a back door and through an alley where they hold hands again. I don't think these two know what they're doing to me, man. They just narrowly avoid a CG blade booby trap that swings down in front of their faces and also pass by a woman calmly sitting on a bench and humming a little ditty next to a burning body that we can go ahead and add up on the count. Toast they meet up with Lainey at a pre-arranged pickup spot, and once inside the van, Charlie says they have to stop the assassination attempt. If they assassinate him, he becomes a martyr. We lose. Oh yeah, good point, Charlie. Hey, also, maybe put your lips on Leo's lips. It'll be great. The triage van is knocked on its side by an armored vehicle, and Charlie is abducted out of it while everyone else is still lazing about. The armored van drives off with its senatorial prize, but luckily, Lainey and the Deli Boys promise to help Leo get her back. They figure she's being taken to Our Lady of Sorrow for the NFFA Purge Night mass, and that's where Earl and his Nazi crew deliver her to be tied up on a dolly in a sacrificial frock. The final touches to her festive appearance are done by NFFA page boy Harmon James, who looks like he spends his free time making out with Dementors. Out on the church's altar, Minister Edwidge Owens gives a passionate sermon preaching the benefits of the purge, and leads his NFFA congregation in a chant of purge and purify. <laughs> Purge! 
Harmon James brings out another dude tied to a dolly named Lawrence, who the minister says will make a healthy purge sacrifice for them and all their weapons blessed with holy water. Harmon gets the honor of being the first purger of the evening, and the skeletal lickspittle stabs Lawrence over and over with a short blade, while Minister Jones gets super fucking into it behind him. Shit, maybe these two are the ones that need to kiss. <laughs> See, they're super into it. Go ahead and paw at the minister's belly there, Harmon. Yeah, that's nice. Outside by the church's tunnel entrance, Leo approaches Dante and tells him that they're no longer on a mission to assassinate, but rather one to rescue the senator. The two of them, Laney and the Deli Boys, and all of Dante's men go through the tunnels and get ready to strike from various points inside the church. Leo sneaks his way behind a security guard and shanks him in the back a couple of times, putting him down silently before sneaking up on another guard up in the church balcony, who he tackles and I'm assuming kills, even though we only see him throw a punch. I just don't think he let that guy live. The minister presents Charlie Roan as the next purge sacrifice, and everyone goes fucking nuts at the sight of her. All of the party members come up on stage while the minister blesses Charlie with holy water, and head of NFFA Caleb Warren steps up to get the first stab in. But right after he finishes blessing America, a nation reborn, Marco shoots a rifle from the balcony and lands a headshot on Caleb Warren's, murdering him and really messing up the whole altar sacrifice thing they had going on. A shootout occurs, giving us another real not fun scene for kill counting. But through my exhaustive frame by framing, it looks as though 11 people get killed during it, including 9 security guards, a woman trying to flee down the aisle, and NFFA press secretary Thomas who tries to stab Charlie while she's down. During all of this, Minister Jones manages to escape with some guards, and Harmon James keeps his cool and collects a couple of guns before making his exit. More NFFA guards rush out and fill the balcony with an unholy spray of bullets, but after our heroes take cover, they hear new gunshots ring out, followed by silence. When they look again, they see Dante Bishop and his forces standing over the bodies of all those replacements guards. And since it looks like they killed them all, I'll add 15 kills to the count, since I think that's how many guards ran out and started shooting up into the balcony before everyone took cover. The hell are y'all doing up there? I'm just counting all these bodies, Dante. It's much easier from a higher vantage point. Charlie is freed from her bondage, and my OTP is reunited before Dante is told that his men have captured the minister. He heads back to where they're holding him, locking Charlie out in the process, and passes three more bodies on the ground to add to the count. These were the men who had been guarding the minister, and obviously doing a shit job of it. The minister pleads for Dante to purge him because it's his right as an American. Do it! Do it! Yes! Yes! But instead, Dante capitulates to the senator's pleas for peace. You better fucking win. After they find a bunch of would-be purge night sacrifices in a back room, Dante and two of his men go out to the parking garage only to get attacked by Earl and his Nazi gang, who manage to kill the two dudes Dante is with while injuring him pretty badly. Leo runs out and provides some cover fire that allows Dante to hop into a car that he hotwires in no time. He puts the pedal to the metal and serves himself up a double order of crushed Nazis, killing them by pinning them against the wall. Unfortunately, he missed Earl, who shoots into the car and kills Dante Bishop, the only person to have been in all three purge movies. Rest in peace, Dante. Your character arc gave this trilogy a spine. Earl runs out of bullets and drops his gun, so Leo sets his on the ground to have a good old-fashioned knife fight. It's a cool battle that took them five hours to shoot, and because of Frank Grillo's background in MMA and boxing, he did all his own stunts in this and every other scene in the movie. Eventually, Leo's little stabby puncher guy lets him get the upper hand, up to and including punching a trench right through Danzinger's cheek. A few more stabs gets Danzinger down to his knees, and with his strength all out of him, Leo finishes off the head white supremacist with a whole old back high kick roundhouse to the face. Killed with a kick? I did not see that coming. In the back room, one of the people that Charlie helps rescue makes a frantic run for an exit, only to find pointy-faced Harmon James at the door, who shoots him dead with a shotgun. Talk about an emotional roller coaster for that dude. Harmon also shoots Marcos in the shoulder, but when he goes to shoot Senator Roan with the handgun, Joe gets in the way, and the two men trade shots back and forth, both of them taking a whole bunch of bullets before Harmon is killed with a holy shit headshot. Joe's friends all gather around him as he bleeds out, out, and he tells them everything will be fine as long as the senator wins and changes things. Clutching Marcos's hand, Joe Dixon succumbs to his wounds and dies, a man who just wanted to protect his deli but wound up protecting the most important sandwich of all, the hero that is Senator Charlie Rowe. Two months after the purge, it's election day, and we're finally seeing some development on the sexiest will-they-won't-they they you've ever seen in a dystopian action horror film. Marcos watches the results come in as an anchor announces Florida for Charlie Rome, which seals the deal and gives her the election. Probably because her blue wall held. Oh, also because looks like Texas went blue. That'll pretty much do it. Her first order of business is announced as the elimination of the purge, as Laney hears on her way in to check the results. She tells Marco she'll come by tomorrow to help him fix up the deli some more, then looks at Joe's coach-like portrait on the wall before leaving. The movie ends with Marcos admiring the stars and bars as the news reports violent pro-NFFA protests, and David fucking Bowie kicks in to sing about how he's afraid of America. 
friends, go look that song up because it's dope as hell. And in the meantime, I'll show you these numbers. I voted. 116 people died in the purge election year, meaning the Belko experiment has finally been usurped as the top kill count champion. America, fuck yeah! Like all purges, the victims were full of ambiguity. I counted 82 men, 8 women, and 26 unknowns, meaning as per usual, a whole bunch of dead dudes. With a runtime of 108 minutes, we actually wound up with a kill on average every 56 seconds. What the fuck? I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to those guillotine victims in the alleyway, since they're being killed by a guillotine in an alleyway. That's insane. Dol Machete for lamest kill can go to Joe, since he got killed by some dude who all of a sudden became the main bad guy for a minute. Fuck off, Harmon James. Go write a manifesto in a Facebook post. And that's it. The Purge election year came out in 2016 and made the most money of any Purge film yet, which is probably why we've got a new one, the first Purge hitting theaters next week on the 4th of July. Go see it to support the series, and I'll cover it after it comes out on Blu-ray, because again, that's how these videos work. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Olafur Ivor Christensen and Steven Sharnico. Chelsea and I are going to try to do a podcast review of The First Purge. And again, remember I can't do Kill Counts on movies until they come out on Blu-ray. Also, since I probably won't do a ranked Purge movies anytime soon, my favorites are Anarchy, then Election Year, then the original. Tune in next week when we start a new franchise. And be good people.